Uh, Franklin asked me to stand in for him today. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for his third in the series, Dr. Sagdayev. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. And uh, so it's my last appearance in this, during these few days. And uh, uh, those of you who attended the first lecture, remember I was started to talk about international dimension of a new space initiative. And uh, I'm happy to report that uh, just during the last couple of days, the development uh, in that area was so important. Uh, apparently, there was a major uh, telecon on the level of heads of uh, uh, space agencies, the, or, or the partners uh, in International Space Station, and uh, it resulted uh, in an important uh, interview I found yesterday on a website uh, given by uh, uh, Director General of Rosavia Cosmos, Yuri Kopchev. Uh, he uh, said that whoever had any doubts that something may change uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, NASA obligations before its international partners in, in, in uh, space station, uh, uh, there should be no doubt anymore. Uh, 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 Sean Akif confirmed that NASA would do everything to fulfill its uh, initial obligations. So uh, and I felt that Russians and Europeans now feel much uh, stronger that everything is moving in the right direction. Uh, the second news uh, was also very interesting. It was coming almost the same day uh, from Koptiv and uh, Yuri Semyonov, uh, CEO of Energy Company. Uh, Semyonov, uh, uh, with permission of uh, Koptiv, confessed that uh, Energy Company during uh, last uh, few years uh, uh, was uh, without uh, uh, making a big uh, announcement, w started to work, it is, and now it's uh, halfway through designing a new uh, 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 spaceship for the crew, uh, which uh, he, uh, could uh, uh, carry uh, twice as many astronauts and cosmonauts as uh, standard Soyuz. And uh, compared to the mass of the Soyuz, uh, spaceship, which is about uh, seven tons. This one is uh, between 12 and uh, 13 tons. And uh, the interesting thing, we all remember that uh, uh, Yuri Semyonov at every corner would confess, uh, would complain that there is not enough funds to, to do whatever he needs for space station. I think it was a good news that at least they found some funds to move in that direction. Uh, my interpretation is the reason why uh, this story uh, came out uh, from Russians right now. And Kopchev uh, picked up from Semyonov's announcement and said that we Russians hope very much that uh, NASA would uh, find uh, the role for us uh, in the project uh, to uh, design and build uh, a crew exploration vehicle. That's it's another interesting development. The third development uh, is uh, uh, probably some of you know, uh, because uh, Johnson Space Center uh, uh, had a very important role in preparing for a major science experiment on board of space station. It's so-called AMS, antimatter spectrometer. And uh, after uh, uh, the news uh, uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago that uh, uh, Hubble uh, telescope uh, mission may be interrupted uh, earlier than it was uh, planned long ago because there would be difficult to uh, send shuttle for another uh, uh, repair uh, uh, and upgrading mission in, uh, uh, in that uh, destination. Uh, the AMS experiment, some people thought, also may be endangered. It is uh, quite uh, sophisticated. Uh, it's the biggest in size, uh, and it is quite heavy. 
experiment it uh, it would require to bring uh, a cryogenic system to uh, uh, support uh, superconducting magnet of uh, of record size it would be actually it's going to it must be the first such scale experiment and in terms of fundamental physics uh, experiment it it is unprecedented uh, those of you who uh, was dealing with this experiment I think to, uh, would realize that uh, uh, technical sophistication of that in, in instrument is uh, uh, by order of magnitude above uh, even Hubble telescope as a scientific instrument. So uh, two days ago on the NASA website there was a confirmation that nothing is changing versus uh, AMS experiment. It would be uh, flown. And it's very good uh, news, especially considering that uh, Nobel laureate uh, Sam Ting, professor of uh, MIT, the PI and originator of this experiment, uh, he uh, assembled international collaboration uh, uh, which contributed to different uh, parts of this experiment from more than 10 countries, I think 12 countries were participating and it would be huge disappointment for many of international partners. So I think situation is developing uh, very positively and of course uh, we all understand that now uh, everyone has to contribute in some way or another to uh, formulation of the final uh, notion of exploration and bringing uh, specific uh, content to uh, how it would uh, be implemented uh, with a space station, uh, with a post uh, shuttle uh, uh, transportation technology, and then with the further steps to the moon and uh, to Mars. So uh, let's uh, go back to uh, the particular topic uh, uh, I was uh, hoping to uh, talk today. Uh, more about uh, specifics of electric propulsion. Uh, it, the nature of electric propulsion is such that whatever uh, is a power source, even if it is a megawatt scale uh, nuclear reactor on board, there would be uh, absolutely no way uh, to uh, consider it as a high trust uh, uh, propulsion. It, it is a modest propulsion. Uh, the change of the delta V uh, of the uh, spacecraft or, or the rocket under such type of propulsion uh, over the uh, one orbit revolution period would be uh, substantially smaller than uh, um, orbital velocity of the spacecraft. Then uh, instead of immediate uh, transition from one orbit to another, uh, like it would be done uh, in a classical, in canonical Hohmann uh, transfer, uh, it would take a long time spiraling. At, uh, at uh, one particular disadvantage of this is that uh, gravity assist effect, which always present uh, in Hohmann type uh, transfer, would be absent. And uh, it also uh, would require a different type of uh, control uh, of the, uh, the orbital uh, dynamic of the spacecraft. Uh, uh, very different from conventional uh, powerful combustion engines. And uh, pa particularly, uh, as uh, I mentioned last time, it explains why no one until now was trying to use electric propulsion for direct uh, delivery uh, from parking orbit to geostationary under electric propulsion. Uh, ideally, such type of uh, transfer from parking orbit to geostation location would save a huge mass, uh, but uh, since it, it's taking very long time of the order of, uh, of a year or many, many months, uh, uh, and uh, exposure to vanadium radiation belt, which uh, unavoidably would deteriorate solar panels, no one is using this direct transition. 
Uh, I would like to spend some time to show my own um, uh, particular attempt to find the way how electric propulsion can be used beyond uh, simple station keeping in uh, particular orbit. So uh, I will show you uh, uh, since uh, Hohmann type arguments where you can have a you know very uh, uniquely defined transition from one orbit to another it doesn't work in this case it, it requires a uh, uh, lot of numerical uh, uh, orbital calculations and then selection of most optimal way that's what actually I was doing uh, most of the work I, I did with uh, this particular notebook I am using here so let me uh, move to uh, this particular brief example what I did. So it's not in a PowerPoint this time I'm going to use uh, 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 Microsoft Word presentation. So each particular case would require a special uh, analysis. So the idea I was uh, trying to develop was following. Suppose we have a Soyuz rocket. Soyuz rocket uh, uh, is uh, most popular in uh, was in the Soviet program and now in Russian program. Soon it would be uh, one of the major work uh, major workhorses uh, at Kourou uh, launch site. So uh, Soyuz rocket actually was never used to deliver payload uh, to geostationary orbit, despite of uh, its uniqueness, its uh, reliability uh, and uh, cost efficiency. The reason is, uh, uh, was a, uh, very straightforward. If you want to use Soyuz rocket uh, from Baikonur, which is a, you know, it's a, a home of this uh, Soyuz launching pad, it's a regional launching pad, the inclination you can get uh, from uh, Baikonur is about 50 or 51 degrees. You cannot uh, uh, go to equatorial orbit without uh, huge loss of mass in, 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 in order to uh, make, for, to create a delta V necessary to change uh, the orbit uh, uh, of the spacecraft. So in addition to the delivery to uh, geostationary orbit, it's a change of the inclination. So uh, uh, as a result, there was only one recent, about a month ago, uh, precedent when finally Soyuz was used for, to deliver a tiny geostationary uh, satellite called uh, AMOS-2. Uh, 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 built uh, and now operated by uh, uh, Israel, Israeli company. But it's a rather small uh, uh, size of the spacecraft. So my task was to see whether uh, combining uh, uh, throw weight capability of Soyuz with uh, uh, optimal uh, 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 electric propulsion. One can do uh, this type of job with geostationary orbit. So now what actually uh, happened is what, uh, what, how I did it is the following. There is a Soyuz, as a rocket, as uh, known to many of you, the same rocket which delivers crew uh, to uh, space station or delivers uh, progress cargo ship to space station. So instead of that uh, payload, uh, uh, there is uh, another uh, hardware attached to Soyuz, which is called Fregat. It is an uh, upper stage booster. It's a uh, very reliable upper stage booster. Uh, Russians developed uh, uh, in, during post-Soviet period, actually. Uh, they were using technology of the uh, uh, medium size uh, engines developed specifically for interplanetary flights. Uh, they were uh, use, using it to, to fly to Mars, robotic mi missions to Mars, to Venus, uh, in past to the Moon. 
And so now they have a very uh, reliable upper stage booster, which uh, is now uh, very successful in the international market. Europeans uh, used it a few times uh, lately for, to fly to Mars, Mars Express, and a few other missions. So uh, the, the uh, general configuration uh, of the mission is, uh, of the trajectory is the following. Soyuz delivers to parking orbit. Uh, in parking orbit, uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, the final satellite, which had to be delivered to geostationary orbit at, and attached to it uh, Fregat upper stage booster. Then uh, Fregat booster uh, uh, switched uh, on in such a way that uh, uh, spacecraft is not going to geostationary immediately because it would lose a lot of uh, mass at such transition. But it would be uh, 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 popped up to the orbit where uh, radiation of Van Allen belts is not going to be critical already. And from there, it would be much easier and would not take that much time to uh, uh, implement final uh, delivery uh, orbit race to uh, geostationary orbit. So um, with uh, that uh, idea in mind, I have studied uh, a number of different uh, uh, optional trajectories. So I will show you how it eventually looked like. So all these arguments about long transfer and unacceptable radiation damage, of course, very used. So let me show you two uh, particular pictures. So uh, what you see here, uh, you see the, uh, the inner circle, it's uh, the planet Earth, and then uh, you will see uh, the red uh, ring, which is a simplified depiction of the uh, the area of radiation risk which has to be avoided. And then the inner uh, ellipse of uh, these spirals in both cases is uh, representing, especially on the upper one, represents the initial starting orbit from where I'm uh, trying, I'm using electric propulsion. And then electric propulsion provides uh, spiraling and uh, finally spacecraft delivered to geostationary orbit. What is not seen in this picture is uh, in, uh, at the same time as the orbit race done in a uh, uh, spiraling way, uh, the inclination uh, change uh, from initial to final equatorial also is introduced, but it's, uh, uh, you wouldn't see it in the plane wave. So there are two different uh, type of trajectories. Uh, the first one uh, is such that uh, apogee uh, on the uh, left side, the apogee uh, of the uh, final orbit, it's geostationary, and it is kept constant during all the process of spiraling. Each time uh, apogee is the same at, geost at uh, geostationary distance. So uh, uh, one ma might say that this is exactly according to Hohmann uh, transfer scenario. The uh, lower picture uh, depicts a different scenario, such a scenario when initially uh, spacecraft, before it would be picked up by electric propulsion, is placed uh, uh, on the orbit uh, which uh, has an apogee beyond geostationary. And on the left uh, side of the picture, you see it's and beyond. It's, uh, 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 it's called uh, super synchronous. So it's beyond syn synchronous, geosynchronous orbit. So it is. Uh, 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 it would sound completely uh, unlike uh, Hohmann transfer. And then uh, uh, spiraling finally would bring it to the geo geostationary, and in the process of spir spiraling, perigee would be uh, uh, raised to geostationary, and apogee 
would be brought down to geostationary. As paradoxical as it sounds, it saves fuel and it, uh, most importantly, it saves, uh, uh, substantially saves the time of uh, delivery. And uh, as uh, I, I was telling, the time is a critical element. It should be done as uh, soon as possible. So it's an example which indicates that electric propulsion can be used uh, should be used in, uh, 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 under very different uh, context, uh, different from uh, what we accustomed to in uh, with uh, standard combustion uh, rockets uh, and uh, Hohmann transfer scenario. Then the next. Uh, So what it does is, uh, this uh, uh, plot indicates the following. The question is, if super synchronous is if such overkill going to initial orbit beyond geostationary is so profitable, uh, can uh, it be optimized? How much super synchronous? It depends uh, on the altitude of the apogee. For any given apogee, uh, there is an optimal, uh, oh, sorry, perigee. This would be a perigee on the uh, lower uh, the, the uh, violet uh, dots and the uh, blue dots, uh, they are uh, apogee. The uh, smaller is apogee of initial rocket. The higher should be, uh, smaller the perigee, the higher should be apogee. This is optimization uh, uh, in selecting uh, different uh, choices. So then the next is the following. Of course, uh, in the process of uh, electric propulsion, uh, you uh, consume uh, uh, the, uh, not in this case, not a fuel, but you consume the working uh, uh, gas, the ejector of the electric propulsion, electric thruster. So uh, as uh, we discussed last time, uh, xenon gas is uh, right now is the only practically sensible uh, substance. So all the calculations were done for propulsion using uh, xenon gas. And uh, then uh, uh, it uh, what uh, you will see here is how much xenon is consumed uh, on the, on the uh, uh, y-axis and vertical axis in kilograms per my uh, hypothetical uh, uh, finally geostationary uh, satellite uh, as a um, function of the mass we can additional mass one can gain uh, uh, in uh, delivering to geostationary orbit. So I started uh, with a rather modest mass, uh, something like uh, uh, 700 kilos, which uh, Soyuz and Fregat configuration, based on conventional combustion, can deliver to geostationary orbit uh, in a standard way, without electric propulsion. And then, uh, for very little mass of xenon and some additional time, you can immediately gain substantial mass of the payload of the satellite in geostationary orbit. So it uh, goes here to um, uh, masses uh, uh, two, three times bigger than initial mass uh, without electric propulsion. So it's substantial gain. These uh, plots would not tell you about uh, what is again uh, in uh, time of delivery. Now I will show you this particular uh, thing also. The okay, it's uh, the uh, heavier is the mass uh, one would like to deliver to geostationary orbit under electric propulsion, the longer would, it would take the time, because then you will have to start from lower uh, perigees. So uh, there is a, 
uh, clear uh, dependence of, of the delivery time, which is here calculated in months on x uh, axis, the horizontal axis, uh, from the uh, 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 the gain uh, of them in the, in the mass of satellite. Well, there are uh, several uh, uh, different uh, curves. The blue one, the lowest one, it is what one would get if uh, 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 if one would try to follow Hohmann uh, transfer uh, recipe to keep keeping the apogee constant during this transfer. The red one, you see, you can uh, save uh, substantially in time of delivery. Uh, if uh, one would use this super synchronous approach with the optimal choice uh, of the perigee versus apogee in uh, electric uh, propulsion transfer. And then uh, there is a, a light uh, blue uh, on the right, which is the best uh, without any, po any points. I just gave a qualitatively this indication, uh, trying to say that what's happening now, Russians already announced that they are moving from previous uh, Soyuz uh, rocket, Soyuz uh, uh, 1, which was known to everyone, to a new uh, upgraded, modified Soyuz, Soyuz 2, which would have a, a, a greater uh, throw weight capability uh, better avionics, but uh, that uh, better, uh, greater throw weight capability will, uh, will add in addition to the mass of satellite in geostationary. And uh, mm, uh, my understanding is that uh, Kourou poly, uh, launch site from the very beginning would be equipped with a new version, uh, Soyuz 2. So this picture uh, would tell you how actual uh, evolution of the orbit would uh, look like. I, I think it's a little bit dark, you know, the red uh, color of the, the, the trajectory. Uh, but uh, I tried to show that in this picture, if the third dimension, the uh, change of the inclination angle of the orbit from original to uh, uh, final uh, uh, equatorial. And then uh, this is an exercise uh, which would indicate how big would be the gain uh, if one would use electric propulsion. And uh, without electric propulsion, you know, I, I took 700 kilo of uh, separated mass in geostationary orbit. And then uh, there are choices. The bigger uh, one would like to have a gain in the mass of satellite. The longer it would take for uh, uh, spiraling from this intermediate orbit, and uh, more of the xenon uh, uh, would be spent in electric propulsion in the transfer. For example, uh, if you would uh, add about 50 percent of the uh, to the mass of the geostationary payload. Uh, it would cost you only uh, 1.3 months and uh, 40 kilos spent uh, for xenon. If you want to uh, have uh, uh, to more than double uh, the uh, final separated mass in geostationary orbit, it would uh, uh, require uh, slightly more than three months and uh, 130 kilos of xenon. It's all the calculations for this specific case. And uh, uh, any kind of mission with electric propulsion, whether it is uh, within the uh, uh, gravity field of Earth or uh, go going to uh, heliocentrical orbits to planets, whenever, would require its uh, special calculations and uh, we should forget about uh, simplified uh, standard recipe of uh, home and transfer in this particular case and do from the very beginning. But there is a quite big room for final uh, uh, optimization of the use of electric propulsion. I uh, 
in these calculations, I did not talk uh, about, uh, did not specify special choice of the uh, electric thruster. The uh, only assumption was made here uh, about uh, um, ISP. So I think this particular ISP I used in these calculations was about uh, 2,000 seconds. But you can easily change it. I think general trend would not change. And uh, uh, the next table uh, shows uh, act actually the same result but expressed uh, in terms of uh, multiple launch. If you would, instead of one uh, uh, integrated space, spacecraft, uh, one would be interested in launching uh, uh, a few uh, uh, smaller satellites. This is the case of uh, two satellites at a different, uh, with a different masses. So, and then a price tag in terms of the longevity uh, of the transfer uh, time included. So, and the rest of this exercise is not essential. It's just I was trying to uh, provide a complementary data. What telecommunication operators of the satellites could gain, how many more transponders, considering contemporary technology of uh, uh, telecommunication satellites. And uh, here is even uh, how it could look like uh, uh, the, the two s satellites under the fairing of uh, standard fairing of uh, Soyuz Fregat uh, uh, configuration. Okay, I think this is the end of this particular uh, story. So, okay, if uh, ISP, the velocity of ejector is fixed, is chosen, but not the type of the uh, electric thruster, then the next question is what, uh, how one should approach uh, to make uh, optimal choice of the electrical, electric thrusters. I uh, would uh, consider now only electric thrusters with uh, ISP above 1,000. Uh, so those thrusters who can make a, a substantial difference in mass saving. So the choice would be uh, between uh, uh, four uh, conceptually different types of uh, uh, electric uh, thrusters. Now I would need this machine to do some uh, amateur drawings uh, to show you uh, the difference between uh, these particular things. The uh, simplest of them in terms of uh, the physics uh, and understanding the uh, uh, mechanics of the thruster is uh, so-called ion thruster. In the uh, case of ion thruster, uh, the uh, electric uh, chamber, which is replacing combustion chamber of engine, is made in such a way that it would uh, isolate practically every individual ion created uh, in that chamber. Uh, uh, would place every individual ion uh, e, uh, under the action of electric field, which would accelerate uh, this uh, particular ion. And uh, virtually every ion uh, which would be involved in process of acceleration would, uh, would uh, get energy uh, proportional to the voltage uh, difference uh, between the electrodes, between the anode, where the ions would be uh, injected or created in the process of ionization of the gas. And the uh, uh, cathode, uh, the maximum voltage uh, uh, they could get uh, in uh, passing uh, this uh, particular distance between two electrodes. Now the problem is that how do we make sure that the ion 
reaching cathode uh, would not finally be perished, uh, hitting uh, the cathode. The uh, idea of uh, uh, ion thruster is that the cathode is made in form of uh, uh, transparent uh, electric grid. So conducting uh, wires uh, constituting the grid, they play the role of the cathode. They, they uh, carry the voltage accelerating ions. But uh, uh, the spaces between very thin wires must be much, much greater than the square area, uh, the cross-section of the wires. And uh, the idea is to accelerate ions and then cheat them instead of hitting, uh, reaching the cathode. They will uh, uh, go through the uh, uh, big uh, uh, holes, openings in, in the grid, and then eventually would be lost uh, in uh, outer space, would never come back. So uh, disadvantage of such particular um, engine uh, is, uh, is quite obvious. In order to make sure that the electrons, which must be present in any kind of the system in equal number with ions, would not uh, short circuit the uh, voltage difference we uh, uh, are providing to accelerate ions. It can be done only if the density of plasma, uh, initial plasma, is very low, so it would be uh, disintegrated into any individual ions and electrons. So if you want to, have to collect a substantial thrust, so the big current of ions, it would require to have a huge surface area of this particular grid, uh, uh, transparent for ions, and uh, of course uh, the size of the uh, anode which uh, emits the ions. Uh, this is a, uh, practically it would limit uh, the usage of such uh, thrusters uh, on the level of uh, maybe five or ten kilowatts. So, so this is why what we have now is the biggest uh, ion thruster is uh, having power 4.5 kilowatts and square area is quite large, something, something like that. And uh, the, the second disadvantage is uh, lifetime uh, of these particular thrusters. Even small uh, amount, not uh, every ion, but uh, some small number of ions, uh, instead of missing the final uh, anode made as a uh, grid made of wires, it would hit the wires and uh, they are under constant bombardment and uh, eventually they will be uh, b b burned down. Uh, and uh, uh, the lifetime uh, uh, can be limited. I think uh, uh, Hughes, uh, people who designed the ion thruster uh, and using it, they, they did a tremendous job trying to optimize the lifetime of this grid versus uh, uh, thrust, which these thrusters can uh, develop and uh, 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 they are used on, uh, on geostationary satellites of uh, s uh, 700 series. But st it's probably the end of the, of, the, of, the, of the road with these particular thrusters. The uh, uh, second category of thrusters, which uh, makes one more step beyond approach to dilute to isolate virtually every individual ion is uh, 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 what is called whole thruster. The idea of, the trust, of that thruster is the following. Yes, uh, electrons, uh, the, the, uh, the moment you will try to increase the thrust, the current of ions, the number of ions participating in the scenario of acceleration, uh, you cannot uh, ignore electrons. They, they will be present there. The question is how one can prevent a short circuit effect by electrons which have much greater mobility because they are lighter. Then uh, the idea which is used in this type of thrusters is the following. Uh, uh, 
a moderate to a weak magnetic field is applied uh, to the system in a way that magnetic field is perpendicular to the trajectories of accelerated ions. The uh, physical feature which is used in such thrusters is that uh, electrons having smaller mass, much more mobile than ions, they are much more sensitive to uh, uh, effect of magnetic field. Lorentz force, force acting on electrons is uh, uh, making them uh, to circle around uh, field lines of magnetic field it's much shorter distance with a smaller radius than it would be for ions by at least two orders of magnitude, depending on the masses, of course, of the uh, choices of, uh, of the gas. The heavier would be the, the gas, like xenon, for example, then uh, this uh, difference between electrons and ions uh, is even bigger. So applying such a weak magnetic field in perpendicular direction uh, we would force electrons instead of following uh, uh, the uh, action of electric field in, in creating short circuit effect to circle around magnetic field lines uh, being uh, unable directly to carry the electric current uh, uh, to uh, short circuit ions, ion current. At the same time Magnetic field uh, is chosen uh, moderate to weak in such a way that uh, Lorentz force, which uh, would finally bend trajectory of ions, is very weak and uh, virtually negligible uh, if, uh, for ions. So then you create interesting uh, thing. The, you have electrons. You do not prevent, do not dilute plasma, it's still there. But they are uh, controlled by magnetic field, stopped by magnetic field. And the ions uh, are uh, accelerated exactly in the same manner as it is done uh, in uh, uh, ion thruster under the action of the applied electric uh, uh, field potential difference. And then you don't need uh, the, uh, the wire. The, everything would be done much more compact geometrically. Uh, and then there would be on the final opening. Uh, I, I will uh, uh, make a draw of this particular picture. So uh, one advantage is you can bring the size down immediately. Uh, second advantage is, uh, which is actually a consequence of this uh, decreased size of the system, you know, you, uh, is that uh, you can go to much higher uh, uh, power in these thrusters without being so much limited immediately by the size of the thruster. So uh, this is why uh, there are um, uh, some models of uh, whole thrusters uh, in working which uh, uh, are uh, probably eventually we will reach something like 100 kilowatts of power. There is another uh, interesting advantage of this type of thrusters. The electrons actually being stopped, controlled by magnetic field, uh, they are not uh, at rest. They are not simply circling around magnetic field lines. Uh, there would be... Uh, 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 they will form the electric current in the direction perpendicular to the uh, thrust uh, axis. And uh, this electric current of electrons in specific geometry, which uh, is used in uh, cylindrical geometry, is just a circular electric current which uh, helps to uh, ionize whatever uh, matter of the working gas, in, whether it is xenon or something else, is there. So to use fully the mass of the uh, existing working gas. So uh, the, whole, the reason why uh, the thrusters are called whole thrusters, uh, you may remember from 
basic uh, electrodynamics that uh, uh, whole uh, current is called the current which would be perpendicular to applied electric field and uh, magnetic field. This is exactly the current in this circular motion, uh, uh, cylindrical motion of the electrons while ions are passing by. Uh, Russians started uh, work uh, on uh, whole thrusters very early. I uh, uh, actually was, uh, when I was uh, in, in my first job, uh, I was uh, uh, provided with a dormitory, place in dormitory at uh, uh, Kurchatov uh, Nuclear Center in Moscow. And uh, my roommate in the dormitory uh, was um, a fellow who uh, had a dream. He was a plasma theorist, but his dream was to build an uh, electric uh, thruster. And it was very interesting to follow how his whole life was dedicated to uh, design of different electric thrusters. And uh, his name is uh, Alexei Morozov, and he is considered as a guru, as a father of uh, whole thrusters with a number of patents. Actually, every whole thruster which is in use was virtually designed following his uh, idea. Then I uh, left uh, this field of science and uh, I started to work for uh, space science uh, many years later. And uh, in the uh, mid-70s, there was a very interesting episode when I became probably one of the very first users of uh, electric thrusters. Uh, a German group from Max Planck Institute uh, uh, in Garching, uh, uh, Germany, was preparing a high altitude experiment. The experiment was the following. They, were, they uh, uh, bought uh, second stage of uh, Minuteman 1 rocket, which was decommissioned and sold in uh, different places as a uh, monoblock uh, sounding rocket. Uh, so Germans uh, bought few of them, a solid propellant uh, uh, rocket, very efficient. And uh, they were preparing an interesting ionospheric physics uh, mission. Imagine the main body of this uh, rocket going to the altitude of several hundred kilometers and uh, spin stabilized, it's spinning. And they were planning to put a number of ionospheric detectors, instruments, like measuring uh, parameters of uh, ionospheric uh, plasma, temperature, whatever. And uh, in order uh, to make this experiment uh, more interesting, they uh, had uh, several canisters uh, around the axis of uh, spinning of the rocket. At certain moment, this canister had to be separated. You just would cut, you know, some kind of uh, uh, um, a string, and then the centrifugal force would immediately throw them out. So each of the canister would be slowly moving radially uh, outward from the central body of this ro rocket. Uh, and the experiment was called porcupine because of a lot of antennas. And then scientific instruments on the canisters would communicate, you know, you can send, you know, probing electromagnetic waves, or you can measure properties of uh, ionospheric plasma at different distances and to see the correlation between the data. So it was a very interesting experiment and uh, I was uh, uh, my uh, German colleagues were telling me about this experiment. And then I suddenly realized that there is one complementary thing could be done. I said, would you like to see how the beam of the uh, ions would propagate through ionosphere? He said, how we can do it? I said, very simple. I will provide you with a Russian uh, electric thruster. It, you can put it uh, on canister, and canister, and this this uh, plasma thruster, uh, you can call it ion gun, 
would send the beam of plasma uh, while separating increasing distance from the main body. And the sensors on the main body could see uh, how this uh, uh, beam of uh, particles uh, propagates through ionospheric plasma, you know, in different type of interaction, including wave generation and so on. So can you imagine in 1975 to have a Soviet science payload on something related to Minuteman rocket? So I think we planned everything in a very nice way. Actually, uh, at least on my side, we were able to cheat uh, the authorities. Otherwise, uh, I would not be able to. So he came uh, uh, to Sheremetyevo airport with a canister, which was added to host this electric propulsion. I took it in, a, in about a month. Uh, the standard whole thruster, which was delivered by Alexei Morozov, what is, was installed on the, the canister, and uh, in a similar way, it was, everything was very compact. It was a thruster which uh, uh, was developing uh, 800 watts power, was consuming. So the experiment was very successful, and a number of uh, science papers were written. Uh, little did I know uh, for a number of years about another uh, uh, symbolic significance of the experiment. Uh, uh, after President Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative, suddenly I realized whatever we did was a little simulation of uh, beam weapons in space. <laughs> but of course, the the density of uh, the power was so low, it, it had only scientific value. So uh, the currently whole thrusters are uh, working probably on dozens of telecommunication satellites in space. Uh, Russians also, also were using it on uh, meteorological satellites for little orbital corrections. So together with Zion thrusters, it's, uh, it constitutes uh, uh, already something existed, existing. But uh, again, you cannot go far beyond uh, uh, with the power of even of whole thrusters, even if they are very small. Why? The uh, answer is rather straightforward. Uh, if one would be interested to increase the power, so the current of the escaping ions, then uh, uh, it would require uh, the increase of the magnetic field. And uh, uh, the in eventually, uh, for higher powers beyond 100 kilowatts, uh, magnetic field uh, would be strong enough to uh, change uh, the trajectories of ions. So ions also would be unable to be uh, accelerated directly by electric field. So uh, it would be uh, not anymore whole thruster, it would be something else. And, and the, from the, uh, uh, in, in the language of the fluid dynamics, uh, fluid dynamicists who are develop, developing special approach language to describe uh, plasmas, uh, they have a, a special notion, whole electrodynamics, so when electrons and ions so much separated by magnetic field. If you would increase magnetic field, increase the currents, eventually instead of whole electrodynamics, uh, the media should be described in the language of magnetohydrodynamics. It's, it's classical fluid dynamics uh, uh, with effects uh, of electric currents and conductivity included. It's very different. It would immediately forbid uh, design and the use of such thrusters. So uh, who are our competitors? I mean competitors uh, to Vasimir. There is only one particular um, design of the thruster which can be uh, used at very high power and high density of the media of plasma. It's a magnetohydrodynamic thruster. The whole process of acceleration 
which takes place uh, has nothing to do with acceleration of individual ions in uh, electric field uh, like it was in uh, two previous type of thrusters. Uh, it would be uh, acceleration of the plasma as a media by uh, ponderal motive force. Uh, you will have a plasma as a conducting media, magnetic field. Uh, if you uh, create electric current, uh, then uh, combination of electric current and uh, uh, magnetic field would result in ponderal motive force. It's uh, often called um, uh, ampere uh, uh, force, just a product uh, of electric field, uh, of electric current and magnetic field, and uh, ponderal motive force is perpendicular to both of them. And uh, this particular configuration, about 30 uh, or 40 years ago, was uh, very uh, intensively studied for uh, a different purpose, not for propulsion, but for its opposite. Uh, some of you may remember that there was excitement uh, at the time with so-called MHD uh, generators. Uh, the idea was that if uh, someone would be able to use this type of uh, fluid, like uh, conducting plasma, uh, in uh, 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 power stations, in electric stations, instead of uh, uh, rotors, you know, rotating uh, solid state uh, configurations, then uh, 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 which are using the same type of uh, effect for uh, generation of electric field. So then uh, one can uh, uh, increase the temperature of the uh, machine and then one can increase uh, efficiency, energy efficiency of the power stations using uh, MHD generators. Uh, so uh, the, what was opposite to propulsion was that idea was that somehow in a thermal machine uh, uh, you create a flow of the conducting media of plasma. And then instead of using a piston for conversion of, of uh, mechanical or thermal energy into electricity, eventually you will use uh, or rotors. You will simply use the same effect that mag conducting media crossing magnetic field lines in the machine would generate electric power. Uh, the uh, major effort at that time was applied here in the United States. And uh, I remember uh, my very first trip to the United States in the early 60s. I was a young scientist at that time, was uh, uh, to meet uh, a few outstanding engineers working uh, with MHD generators. The particular uh, company, most advanced company, you may even remember that name because they were also in the rocketry, uh, AFCO Everett Company located uh, on that famous route outside of Boston, close to Cambridge, Massachusetts. They uh, had at that time MHD generators uh, with the power, uh, they were pulsed machines, uh, power of uh, several megawatts. And uh, what they actually were doing, uh, in order to create uh, a flow of conducting uh, media, the plasma, they were using uh, uh, propul conventional propulsion, rocket engine. So rocket engine was creating uh, such a supersonic flow. Then the second step, they needed to make uh, this flowing uh, media, ejecta, con electrically conducting. So they were uh, adding uh, specifically materials which would, uh, uh, like cesium, which would uh, create a certain degree of ionization at the, in the uh, thermodynamic conditions of the ejector from the rocket, and then applying magnetic field. Then uh, uh, Russians uh, started to copy, uh, and there was a huge uh, program in the Soviet Union in MHD generators. What actually uh, happened, why uh, it was abandoned in both countries, you, you wouldn't uh, 
hear any more about. I think it's considered as a deadlock, you know, not moving. Or well, the following, the efficiency of this type of process of uh, 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 conversion of mechanical energy into electric, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, quite opposite to what we need in, in um, MHD uh, thrusters propulsion. Then it's opposite electric energy to mechanical. The uh, efficiency dependent very much on uh, electric conductivity of the plasma. And uh, it was discovered, I think it was Russian discovery, uh, that uh, there is a um, universal unbeatable instability which would develop to cre creating micro turbulence uh, in this uh, flowing plasma in magnetic field which would uh, spoil completely the process of transformation of energy. So, uh, and the whole area was abandoned after uh, big machines were rebuilt. Uh, so, coming back to MHD uh, thrusters, which are using the same principle in opposite order. So you uh, create, you have electric energy, uh, you create uh, the current, and the ponder motive force would uh, move, accelerate uh, plasma flow. Uh, same instability uh, would, it's the same geometry immediately would jump in. And I think uh, I, I followed the, the work which is right now uh, going on in this area. I think they still did not reach this particular point then when they will have the same type of instant micro turbulence. Uh, uh, the, and then there is a generic problem uh, to create the current in this type of uh, machine you would need electrodes and uh, the, uh, to get uh, appropriate electric conductivity of this plasma to be ejected, accelerated, you uh, would have to rise the temperature of this plasma. And then uh, you have electrodes and uh, this hot plasma contacting the walls, the electrodes. It's uh, losses of uh, energy, uh, re reduced uh, le energy efficiency of the thruster, and erosion of the uh, material of the walls and the, the electrodes, first of all. So uh, these factors which eventually would uh, clearly play uh, a negative role. There is a third argument which uh, makes it much more difficult. In uh, any kind of machine which is using electric current to control uh, the parameters of the media, like in this MHD case, uh, there is a 